The next portion of the conference I am incredibly excited about because we are going to have some real experts here sharing their experiences and uh, helping us further the conversation uh, that we kind of started in the icebreaker about these different challenges. Um, and so leading and facilitating the panel is a really exceptional woman, Rebecca Sawali. She is with F.L. Schmidt. Uh, she's a global mining industry leader. She began her career in the mining industry 21 years ago as a plant metallurgist and frontline supervisor. She's worked in various positions, um, including uh, with responsibilities for driving optimization projects, aimed at improving productivity and enhancing plant performance for several mining companies, including Glencore, um, Vedanta Resources, and Freeport, MacMoran. Uh, she joined F.L. Smith in 2012 as a senior process engineer, and she certainly serves as the global director for productivity and digital services. Um, she's, she's just amazing. And when we got her involved in the in the process of planning the conference, she just jumped right in. Um, for the people who were able to attend the speaker and sponsor uh, reception at F.L. Smith's office last night, she was instrumental in planning that. Uh, she's also been incredibly important in the um, in the Utah chapter of Women in Mining, and. I mean, she's just phenomenal. I am so glad that I had the opportunity to come to Salt Lake City to meet her in person um, because I I just feel like she is an incredible asset for the mining industry and for women in mining. So Rebecca, please come on up and she is going to introduce the rest of the panelists um, and has a, a brief introduction as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Amanda, uh, for that introduction. I'm quite flattered. <laughs> um, and I thank you, everyone, for joining us in person and uh, virtually. We, uh, with the panel, are beyond excited to discuss the multiple viewpoints um, of approaches and challenges to improve the mining, mining industry's reputation to attract a diverse workforce. Um, it's clearly been proven uh, that uh, diverse groups, uh, be diverse, diversity in genders, ethnicity, cultural backgrounds, and uh, sexual orientation uh, produces a more creative, innovative, and effective results. Uh, that's because diverse groups offer a wider range of experiences and don't simply parrot back to some old ideas. Uh, this year's conference theme, which is uh, changing the face of mining, is a testament to that. And you will see that just visually when our pan panelists sit down. Um, we are seeing the change in mining. Uh, these companies that are making huge strides, uh, to mention a few, BHP, Rio Tinto, uh, Newmont, Anglo-American, and uh, Fortescue Metals. Um, just to highlight a few of the goals, and this came up uh, in our discussion on our table, uh, you know, with uh, Gary, who's uh, working with uh, BHP and sits on their board, you know, they have uh, really put together some uh, tough KPIs, you know, to reach 50% uh, gender parity by 2026. I believe they're at about 30% now. Will they get there uh, in, in a couple of years? maybe, and uh, we are really rooting for them. We have Rio Tinto who've set up a goal to increase uh, women in management by 2% every year, and also have 50% um, uh, gender uh, parity in, in all their new hires. Um, so I think they are also moving in the right direction. Uh, Anglo-America reported a 27% increase in their female senior leadership in January of this year, and uh, most recently, actually last month, they named their first female CEO to run the South Africa iron ore business. Really, really great. Uh, we look at Fortescue Metals, and uh, they are at a 50% um, female representative on their board of directors. Um, that's a really excellent work. And so we are also here today to celebrate all the achievements that has been done. Are we where we want to be? No. Um, is there still a lot of work to be done? I believe so. So I think uh, in all fairness, we need to give ourselves a round of applause on the work that we've done, done to date.
Okay. Um, I'll just uh, go through how the panel session will run before I bring up the panelists. So we'll have two parts to the panel session. The first part, I will facilitate the questions to the panelists, and that uh, we are estimating that to run for about uh, 30 minutes. And then we'll move to the second part where we'll open questions to the audience. Um, very happy to have Ashley Dibble, and she's, Ashley, if you raise your hand, she's right there. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand and she'll run the mic to you. We also have Emily Rose right in the back. So for those who are joining us virtually, she'll also take questions uh, from you and uh, we'll, we'll move between both Ashley and Emily. And uh, at the end, we will have the panelists uh, wrap up uh, with any uh, form of advice uh, to the audience. And with no further ado, I would like to bring up Rajiv Ganguly. Uh, Rajiv is a professor of mining engineering, uh, University of Utah. Uh, Dr. Ganguly has been working on artificial intelligence for the mining industry applications for the last two decades. He is currently working on big data algorithms that help detect when sensors first start to stray. Uh, his previous projects include aerial systems for underground mines, bacterial remediation on acid mine water, enhancement of mineral flotation processes, recovery of rare earth metals, and a training simulator for grinding mills and effect effectiveness and core combustion. So welcome, Rajiv. Thank you. I am also very uh, privileged to introduce Iris Fali. She is the Senior Director of Human Resources at Komatsu. And uh, Iris has 22 years of experience in her current role and IRIS focuses on strategic workforce planning, organizational development, and sponsoring the company's diversity and equity and inclusion efforts. IRIS came out as a transgender in 2020 and is committed to advancing LGBTQ plus representation and advocacy in her personal and professional life. Okay. We also have Laura Gartner. Laura is head of digital services uh, for Anglo-American. Uh, Laura has 15 years of experience in the energy sector, working on oil field solutions in various roles before moving into the mining industry. In her current role, she enables business units and sites to embrace a new way of working with digital solutions to improve operational efficiencies, reduce costs, and bring safety and sustainability to their operations. Okay. And our fourth panelist is Sudashu Singh. And uh, Sudashu is with, uh, is with the Mining Center of Excellence and works as a general manager for Caterpillar. And uh, Sudashu is responsible for providing global sales and marketing leadership, a series of global leadership roles in different countries in product support, sales, manufacturing, quality operations, and general management across. And he's been doing this for 30 years. Okay, so we'll start up um, just looking at the topic of discussion today. And I'll pose this to the audience, both uh, virtually and out there. What's the first word that come to mind? And if you could look at your neighbor on the right and left and share that with us. And I would also encourage the panelists to think about that first word that come to mind. And if I can just quickly hear people, the audience shouting out that word. Okay, so, okay. sure, no problem. Um, so our topic today is approaches and challenges to improve mining's reputation to attract a diverse workforce. And the question was uh, for you to turn to your neighbor on the right and left and think of that word that uh, comes to your mind on the topic.
just have the topics. Uh, please, if you don't mind, um, and I'll, I'll just be pointing at tables randomly, if you could just shout out any word that came to mind. Excellent. Tables around here. Okay, uh, equality. Reputation. Reputation. Representation, commitment, commitment courage, courage education. education. Emily, did we get anything from the virtual? Okay. And for our panel, I'll just go, I'll start with uh, you, Rajiv. Bravery. Okay. Aris? Um, I'd offer up mindset. Excellent. Laura? I'm going for digital. Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> Technology. Excellent. Yeah. So I, I, I think this, okay. yeah, you know, we, we've gone around the room and um, I think all the words really speak to our topic today. And I will actually start up by asking uh, Rajiv that question. And uh, Rajiv is joining us um, from academia. And uh, so for Rajiv, uh, where do you see the future of education and research heading? And how do we use these new methods and discoveries to attract a diverse workforce? Thank you. You know, professors speak in chunks of three hours. No, <laughs> I, 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 I just said that to make you aware of the exits so you're safe. <laughs> but I don't know if you all heard of uh, this one word, Zoom. I take it you have. So uh, Zoom is part of my answer, but I'll get to the next one as well, which is modularization. And I'll tell you a story. Not too long ago, um, I taught Greenlanders sitting in Salt Lake City, computer in mind design, right? So the US is helping Greenland up their, upskill their mining training. Second, I taught a group of biologist, human scientists, how to use natural language processing to detect patterns in safety incidents. Two things, all doing from my room, right? Third, that connects to the other part is modularization. So it's very interesting, you have scientists who have their subject matter expertise that is different from what I was teaching them. But they thought, you know what? Eight hour course, 40 hour course, training that is going to allow me to do my new responsibilities. So one of the things that I see is modularization. That is a big, big part of that. And universities are responding to that. And, and part of it also for diversity purposes. So for example, my university, uh, the University of Utah Mining Engineering Program, we created certificates almost entirely so we could service rural Utahns, for example, uh, somewhere in Price, uh, somewhere else, where they could not come join the mining program or to recruit a diverse population. So they could come, take courses that are very, very effective. So it's very interesting now. You know, Zoom is not just a video, you know, uh, you're not just seeing their face. You can actually interact with them, right? I mean, all of you have done it. You can actually share their computer. The training tools are now very effective. I did, I remember uh, we had a project uh, 10, 12 years ago, and uh, I was working with Oyu Tolgoi, and I was working with uh, uh, some of the mining companies in Mongolia. It was very technical, but it was really clunky. That's not the case anymore. So online education, all of that existed before, but we do it so much more effectively now. And when you measure the learning outcomes now, they actually learn. You can actually have somebody with effective uh, analytic skills after 40 hours and A, you're able to do it. B, they recognize that this modular skill set 
is actually useful, right? And universities are responding to that need. Our president, you know, he is uh, championing these short certificates. So when you come now, I think not just us, perhaps other universities as well, they, they are giving this modular education. Because I think, like it or not, we are, I think, in a phase of constant upskilling, right? The, the training we give gets you your first job. After that, right, uh, you're constantly changing. And so you have to get that training. And, and so, yeah, so that's really my uh, uh, two cents there. Uh, effective delivery, you know, remote education delivery. And second is modularization, so. Okay. And uh, to follow up with uh, that question, Rajiv, where, when do you think it's the right time to reach out um, to our community um, for recruitment? And, and have you make any ad made any advancements in that area as well? That is a great question. So I feel like kids start thinking about careers, uh, perhaps by the time they're in middle school. Before that, you know, uh, uh, we're trying to chase frogs and all those other things, which are very important to do, right? But I recently gave a talk. Now, this is another reach of Zoom, if you will, right? You can actually reach out to more people around the world. And I was talking to a bunch of middle schoolers in the Canyon School District here at high school counselors. I talked about mining. And the counselor says, I never even knew. And this is in a town where you can see the big mine. It's not little, OK? <laughs> Right? You can kind of see what happens there, right? But yeah, it's those things. You can reach out. And so I think middle school is, is perhaps where we need to start. And the problem is bigger than a university or, or anybody else. We all have to get together. And, you know, we're all sucking from a very thin straw. We need to widen the pipeline in the beginning. By the time you come to me, you know, and say, hey, I, I want a diverse set of engineers. It's too late because I sucked from the same thin straw. And your straw is thinner than mine. Right? And the problem only gets worse. And so to us, we have to use these tools. And perhaps now, you know, I've always asked companies, could you spare an engineer or two when I go to a mine? Now, guess what? Now, you don't have to send that engineer to me. Perhaps they can join me when I'm talking to high school live. And can you imagine this young girl looking at his engineer, a GM, right? The, you know, Elena, for example, and saying, wow, I could be her, right? But Elena doesn't have to come with me to a school in, in, in Utah, in rural Utah, and these types of things, I think we can uh, diversify the pool early on, you know, widen the pipe, so. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, the next question is for Iris. Uh, what advice would you give to other companies attempting to create a more equal, uh, diverse, and inclusive environment, and how can we attract the next generation so primarily talking about Gen Z. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, wow, there's a lot there. So let me, let me sort of unpack it bit by bit. Yeah. I, I think that um, in the diversity and inclusion space, um, as part of, say, the HR discipline, there's a debate that goes on around what do you go after first? Do you go after diversity? Do you go after your hiring practices? Do you bring in more people? that represent a broader set of perspectives? Or do you go after inclusion and build the foundation within the business, build the mindset within the business, so that when you do attract that talent, um, they're coming into a place that is welcoming, supportive, sustainable for them? And the fact of the matter is, it's probably both. It's probably both at the same time. Um, which is difficult, right? Because it is a chicken egg thing and you're trying to take care of the chicken and the egg at the same time, which is fundamentally difficult to do. Um, I don't know, chickens. But uh, <laughs> so, so the inclusion piece to me though is what really gets interesting because that is where you start to look at the values of an organization. That's where you start to, um, work with leaders, coach leaders, coach everybody on what it means to act in a way that's consistent with a value of diversity or a value of inclusion. Um, Rebecca started by saying, you know, it, it's a known fact that diversity is a strength for companies. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, but I think there are a lot of people that aren't there yet. 
So how do we bring them along so that they are seeing that same idea and accepting it as fact and starting to work from that point? So there's a lot of mindset work that we have to do within our organizations to get people to the place where they want to be in a room like this one discussing the things that we're here discussing today. The sustainability piece that I mentioned, I think gets to what are you looking at once you get that person on board? How do you support them? So I'll use just as a quick example, just a little bit of my own journey over the last year and a half or so. Um, Rebecca mentioned I came out as trans in, in 2020. And it just so happens, and it's a funny thing, I was already working on a policy within our HR team to support people who were going to transition genders. I truly had no idea that I would be the first person to use it. <laughs> I, last thing I expected. And yet there I was saying, okay, so how do we use this? A year and a half on, I look back at it and say, yeah, we need to go back and look at that because I've learned some things as a person going through this lived experience that I never knew to account for when we built it. And nobody involved in building it knew to account for it. So how do we bring in the voices and ask people, whether it's women, whether it's uh, people from racial minorities, different uh, sexual orientations, gender diversity, whatever, bring in their perspective into what we're doing, because we're doing it with the best of intentions, right? We're doing it with the best research we can find and all those things, but there's that lived experience that has to come into account and can make us that much better and more sustainable. I think of a company I used to work for, HSBC, they made headlines a couple of years back because of something they were doing in India with um, their efforts to bring back women who had left uh, the company to go and um, raise children. And a lot of their efforts had to do with how do we support what's going on for those women outside of work to make it viable and easier for them to not only come back into the workforce, but to succeed and thrive once they got there. Those are the kinds of questions and thoughts I think we need to be thinking about as we think about how do you make inclusion sustainable? It's not a check the box exercise. And finally, I'll touch on this generation question. Um, knowing that we have some folks from Generation Z in the room, I am going to make the disclaimer I always make when talking about generations. When we talk about a generation, we are talking about vast numbers of people. These are broad generalizations, right? But there is good research that shows that um, it's just a different take. It's a different understanding. And again, I'll, I'll pick on gender diversity for a moment. Um, people who are non-binary. I, I, I listened to, uh, listen to some of the, the speakers last night that were kicking off the reception we had. And it was great and it's so good that we had senior leaders coming up and, and making statements about how important it is to have women in mining and to build diversity within the mining space. And it was all about men and women. And we've got a generation coming into the workforce that understands gender differently, where non-binary isn't even a point of education. They're bringing it. And the interesting thing, there's a, a, some work that's been done by the Center for Generational Kinetics out of Austin, Texas, and they, they've looked at a lot of this, and one of the things they talk about is that it isn't as much, in previous generations it might have been, is this company going to be a safe place, a welcoming place, an affirming place for me to work? What they're finding is that in Generation Z and likely the ones that come after, it's not just that, it is that. But it's also, is this a place I'm gonna be proud to tell my family about? Proud to tell my non-binary or gay or lesbian or trans friends, and I'm just picking on that swath, my African-American friends, my Asian-American friends, whoever it is, that I am going to a company that would welcome them if they wanted to be there. That's another step and something we need to be thinking about because when we're trying to sell our industry and our companies to people in these upcoming generations, they're gonna be pushing for that. And we need to be ready with answers. Thank you, Iris, uh, Laura. Uh, I know digital came to mind and uh, you and I have spoken about um, 
what are we doing within digital and um, how could uh, that appeal to a diverse workforce and how can digital solutions support, uh, support these uh, sustainability initiatives? Yep, thanks. I think one important story to kind of start and answer that is really how my life was when I was a few years younger, where I was taking my kid around with me, trying to go to plant sites, and I had the plant manager's grandma was babysitting my one-year-old son while I was trying to go into the plants and, and do my job and try and put in my hard work and show that I was really there as a female in an oil and gas industry, which is very much uh, man-driven at the time. And showing that I still wanted to show up, I wanted to do that, I wanted to work just as hard as everybody else, and I would find a way to make sure my family was still taken care of when I wasn't there. I think moving forward a few years, bringing digital much, much more into this space, and especially into mining, we no longer have to be in the operations, in our hands, getting dirty every single day. You now have that capability of remote operating centers. You can, you know, move from a remote location for a mining operation into, you know, downtown Santiago. And it's more appealing to women to say, let me just go. This is like almost like a normal job. I don't have to get dirty. I can take care of my family in the evenings, you know, and it's much more appealing to have that capability and that opportunity for women that really do want to work in this industry. And they didn't really have the opportunity to do that in the past. Perfect. Thank you, Laura. Um, a question for you, Sudashu. Um, how do we improve mining's reputation? Um, really changing that face of mining. Uh, there is perception that the mining industry is not as diverse as it should be and does not offer a fair work life, work balance. I think Laura touched a little bit on that, um, especially for you know, a working mother. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, how could we mitigate or even remedy uh, this, this perception? And this question obviously to you is from the viewpoint of uh, women in operations. Thanks, Rebecca, and good morning, everyone. It's a real honor to be here. And and I just want to tell you a little bit of my personal story, which uh, is very similar to some of the story Elena talked about this morning. Uh, when I got into the mining industry about 30 years ago, I grew up in India with sisters. And first time they went near the big machine, the big trucks and shovel that I was working on, uh, one of them asked the question that, hey, I noticed there's no female around these machines. And I have had a chance in my role to travel the world been to a lot of country, a lot of mines, and I was telling uh, my table in discussions that naturally I still pay attention to how many operators are females, how many mechanics are females. And it has been a, a, a personal uh, challenge for me being in the industry so long that how do we uh, uh, think about this differently to move the needle? And as you know, at Caterpillar, uh, you know, we are a significant uh, a presence in mining through our dealer network worldwide. And we believe that uh, diversity and inclusion is really important for us to succeed in the industry as well as help our customers where ultimately a lot of value is created in mining. And uh, the more diverse workforce we have, the better we can serve our customers as well as our dealers. And and I think we don't have to debate the benefit that we all get. You know, the diversity does create uh, faster innovation. We have noticed that in many areas we operate. And when we look at the talent base, uh, the challenges facing the industry, and to some extent uh, in all areas of the value chain that we operate, it's uh, what our customers are facing, what problems they're trying to solve, what our dealers are doing, and what we need to do as a manufacturer. And so we have had a lot of engagement uh, in different communities. And I think I agree with Professor Gangli's comment earlier that we really got to start at the uh, school level. And the STEM program, you know, through the CAT Foundation, we have started engaging a lot. And one of the focus we have is we got to go in the communities that our customers are present through directly or through dealer network. So we, we try to influence the talent that's there, trying to build the pipeline. And I loved your analogy, to Professor Gangli, about the straw, because that's the challenge for all of us is we got to grow this talent pool. And so that's some of the things we are doing, trying to address this longer term to sustain it 
because you know we can have some very focused uh, uh, goals and KPIs, but if we don't sustain it, you know we are a very cyclical business, and we could potentially uh, have a challenges in sustaining this for 20, 30, 40 years. So starting early is a big deal we are focusing on through our CAT Foundation. The other area that I think we have seen and we have received a lot of good feedback is the transformation that is happening in our industry over the last 15, 20 years. The role of technology is going to play a big role in leveling the player field for all diverse talent. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we were so delighted when one of our customers gave us an example of how they were able to hire a uh, partially disabled and wounded veteran to remote uh, uh, operate one of our dozers. And you can imagine, this was totally unimaginable about 10 years ago. You know, to access one of these big mining machines, you have to be at the mine. You have to be exposed to different elements. And if you are disabled partially, there's no way that person could have gone to the site. So the technology is enabling this thing. And it also has enabled some of the mines to operate partially remotely. And so the people who had to fly in for two weeks and fly back, that is a challenge in some of the remote sites. So leveraging the technology to remotely operate sites is creating, uh, opening our industry to a talent base that was not earlier interested in coming. You know, similarly, I think if you think about uh, all of us think mining differently. And mining as a team, we have been very focused on safety. But still, if you go to the college uh, students or some other, you know, in this digital world of iPad, iPhone, and all kind of, of convenience, going into the elements of dust and, and tough environment is not natural. So we believe that leveraging the technology, leveraging some of the cloud computing uh, data analytics and monitoring that we are doing, we should be able to uh, translate some of those uh, meaningful operations remotely in a normal environment where uh, most of the talent base is. Because let's be very honest, what challenges we have faced about uh, talent in mining is going to continue to be a challenge because there is going to be so much uh, changes happening in the world uh, environment over the next 20, 30 years with focus on uh, uh, emissions or uh, electrification and autonomy, automation. And so, so we as a mining will continue to have some very site operations, but how much we digitize that or how much we leverage technology to move it away from the site into a better environment will play a big role. And one last thing I want to uh, mention is uh, we have seen some very, very good results. So we have been investing as a team Caterpillar into the machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, you know we are still very, very early in that journey uh, related to the mine operations, but uh, one of our customers uh, was sharing with us because part of the challenge you face in machine learning and artificial intelligence is employing very high caliber data scientists or highly qualified individuals that sometimes are very challenging in a mining environment, whether it's a location or whether it's a cost. And so the, some of the innovative ideas that have come in that space is that how do you take the machine learning and artificial intelligence and make it meaningful to the frontline operators and the maintainers before you think something big in, uh, uh, in a bigger scale? So that has given some very good early results in some of the experiments that have been uh, running. And so we believe that uh, you know, the focus of the whole industry and all the players in the industry uh, with technology, we can uh, change the landscape of the jobs so that we can open the industry more to other art of the, like you don't need to be, a, I'm a mining engineer, but I think one of the challenges we have is we have to create a transformation so that you don't have to be a mining engineer to be in mining. And I think a lot of our customers are doing that. And so how do we take a, a very lean and continuous improvement approach of taking a standard work and break it down in a way that's meaningful to the large workforce that is available worldwide, so. Okay, perfect. Thank you, and I think we are ready to open up questions to the audience. Uh, so please, if you have a question, raise your hand and Ashley would run the mic to you. Thank you. I guess my question kind of looks at kind of how we present ourselves to people as an industry 
and also looking at you know the changes being made digitally and doing things remotely. When I went to school, I'll date myself, yeah, here's pictures of haul trucks, maybe a shovel, a drill, a grinding mill, and people wearing hard hats. I was back in the day where we were making a transition from slide rules to hand calculators. Yet I look at today when we go out and say, oh, we're mining, what do we show pictures of? Haul trucks, drills, <laughs> people in hard hats. That's true. What can we do to kind of emphasize what's going on in the digital world to attract people? Where are there pictures of, you know, mining control rooms with all the screens and the people doing that? Operating rooms and mills with what they're doing and showing it isn't just going out there, you know, putting on a hard hat and being out in the dirt. And maybe that would help get more interest in students going into the field. Okay. I'll take Wanna it. Take it. I would love to take that one. I think, uh, one, I have a little bit of a marketing background, so I definitely help uh, working within our organization as far as how we can change what are our common uses of the imagery that we have and how can we go into the newly formed remote operating centers and make, you know, make mining look cool so that people look and see, oh, this is almost like a tech company. I want to go be like Tesla or Google. Mining is no longer this industry that is just trucks and just hard hats. How can we make that change? And I think it definitely comes with changing some of the advertising and marketing usage around all of our companies. As we all know, they probably are still using the same trucks. Um, that They're not going away, but I think having different pictures and showing the transition of everything being operations in the dirt to there are operations that are remote that are using digital technologies to really change how the mining industry is working. Okay, perfect. Uh, do we have uh, table 20? Is that a question? Yeah, so I guess my question, I think... You touched on it a little, uh, saying you were bringing your child to work. Is I, I fully understand we need to widen our pool and, and get people involved with their young, but I think the, the she session is uh, showing it now. How are we making it, making women able to keep their job, hold a job, especially when you're thinking of a 24 hour operation? Um, just any ideas or what companies are doing right now to make it easier for women to stay in the work once they, once they get out of college and start having children? I'll offer up a couple of thoughts there. Um, there is an ongoing study by a group called the Catalyst Group that looks at, um, across industries, uh, participation by women and what drives that and what companies are making strides there. And one of the things that, that they have found is that the companies that do really well in this space, and this is going to sound really, really simple, they acknowledge that the needs of women in the workplace are different. There is a tendency, and I think it, it's a tendency that's been driven in some ways by maybe by employment law, litigation, anti-discrimination over the years, and those are all important things, don't get me wrong. But even the best things can have unintended consequences. And I think the unintended consequence at times is we are going to treat everyone the same no matter what. We aren't going to acknowledge that there are differences, differences in experience, differences in needs. And so there are things that um, the findings of this, of this study have called out around um, paying attention to women's health care differently, looking at uh, daycare needs differently, looking at adoption and maternity leave programs. And some of these things, and I, those are just a few examples, but there are more that look at what are the things that we need to take care of. And this is the sustainability I was talking about. What do you need to put as a constellation of services and support outside of the job to make it possible for somebody to be truly there, giving everything they've got for the time they're at work so that they can thrive, they can advance. Of course, you do that while you're attacking all the other stuff that we were talking about earlier. 
but I think that's a part of it, is really acknowledging what the different needs are, taking them on, and, and just being willing to have a conversation in an environment that too often says, we're all the same. Just a thought. Add to that, if yes. you don't mind. Absolutely. I think really having the flexibility in the office place, I think COVID kind of forced that in the remote work thing. And, you know, within Anglo American, we do a lot of digital literacy, data science, nano degree type certification, so that the women that maybe were in a different type of operational job in the past, we don't want them to leave in the she session. We will retrain them into more digital tech jobs that allows them to work from home and they can still be a participant of the organization just as if they were in a mine site. So. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to add to that, so this came up in a conversation we had yesterday uh, during the council meeting. Um, I, I think having the right conversation between the employee and the manager is also important. So um, one of the ladies um, who's currently at home on maternity leave, very happy with uh, the relationship she has with her manager. And the conversation was not, when do you come back to work? But the conversation was, what can we do to make your transition back to work easy? And, and I think that's what it should be beyond policies, but also a relationship between managers and employees. Yeah. Do we have any questions uh, virtually, Emily? Yes, we do. Okay. So um, one of the questions we have, oh, okay, I gotta stand. <laughs> so one of our questions from uh, virtual participation comes from Janice, and it says, mining by public companies uniquely has to state the years of the mine life. Um, and then so some, are, some mine lives are longer than others. Um, and then other businesses don't have the same stipulation of um, stating the years of the mine life. So how might this be impacting our ability to attract workers? You know, uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, the, the loyalty between employer and employee and vice versa is not what it used to be. So I think in the olden days, you're looking for your next 30 years. Now they're looking for the next two-year gig. So I am not sure that necessarily impacts uh, and, and uh, the hiring. That, that, that's my perspective, but yeah. I, I guess one of the things that comes to Am I on? Okay, there we go, okay. Um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is uh, career pathing and mobility um, and movement within an organization. So yes, there may be a site that is local that has a limited remaining uh, operating lifespan, but what can we do to create movement for individuals so that they can possibly uh, look to advance elsewhere within an organization that is more sprawling than that one site, right? Um, one of the things we, we look at in our succession planning, and this gets to uh, advancement of women, one of the things we found is that, yeah, we have women uh, in our company on the succession chart. A lot of them are in HR, they're in finance, they're in supply chain, which is all great. But if you want to see women break through to the, the C-suite, to the upper echelons of, of leadership, one of the things we also talk about is, well, if somebody wants to aspire to those roles, they need to take a turn out in the field. They need to be in sales, or they need to be in service, or they need to be in operations. And usually if you're in operations, that's fine. You still need to be in sales or service. And when we look at the charts for those functions, not a lot of women there. I can think of one at the moment. And um, you know what? When she makes it, she's going to be great. Uh, but we need to be better about that. We need to think about how do we um, move, create more opportunities to bring women into some of those spaces where it gets back to that question about mind life is, you know, we should look for where we've got the options. We should set the expectations that sometimes advancement means mobility and then create the opportunities for that mobility to happen. Great, thank you. We have one more question. 
Hi, my name is Kelly. Um, so one of my questions is, how do you make a workplace safe for women in terms of, I hear stories about women that are being sexually harassed or that are being discriminated against in many ways, and their coworkers that they speak with agree that it shouldn't be happening, but they're not willing to stand up and say anything. So, because they don't want to be painted with the same brush. They don't want to then be discriminated against. So how do we make it a safer environment for all women and, and stand up and say that what we're seeing is wrong? I feel like you were looking at me during that whole question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, but I will take a crack at it. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's an endemic problem, right? And it's not just our industry. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're in an industry or we serve an industry that is, uh, let's face it, doesn't have a great history in that regard. I think for me, you know, I'm, I feel fortunate in that Komatsu has adopted inclusion as one of its core values because that gives me something to lean on and something to coach around and to start to coach our people around and try to embed it in the same way we talk about safety. Because you're asking, you asked a really deep, painful question, and I don't want to give it short shrift with this answer, so please bear with me. But, you know, we talk about safety culture, and it's the first thing I thought of, the idea that if somebody is doing something un unsafe, We've all been in safety shares. We all have heard people talk about the need to step up, say something, stop the activity if it's unsafe, and correct it. And I think for me, the question is, what can we do within our organizations? Again, to me, it gets to mindset to lean on our values. And let's face it, even if, even if a company's value isn't specifically inclusion, respect is probably in there. Dignity is probably in there. We've all got something in our values that we can lean on or just values as human beings to say this shouldn't be happening. So how do we get to that, that <laughs> the phrase we use is brother's keeper, so forgive me for being gendered in that, but that brother's keeper's mentality that says I see something going on that's hurting one of my coworkers and I want to make sure that they're safe, in this case emotionally, psychologically, how do I safeguard that as well? I think that's, that's ongoing work in society, but it's certainly ongoing work within our industry. And um, I think being able to lean on what the company espouses and call it out and say, what you're doing right now is not in line with who we are, I, I think that's important. But we've got to make sure that as you do that, you're being supported all the way up the line and that, that that embrace of the company values is being echoed at every level of the organization so that people don't feel like they're going out on a limb to challenge something like harassment, like discrimination when it's happening. Okay. Emily, do we have any questions from the virtual audience? Okay. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, have your hand up. Hi, my name is Megan. I'm from Arizona and the Arizona chapter. And I had a question about the, the younger generation and promoting our industry to them. And the question was, you know, just to, the, the change is coming. It's coming gradually and kind of giving them encouragement that it's, this is a improving workforce for diversity and inclusion and being mindful of, of what the younger generation is looking for. So I was wondering if you could share any learnings and recommendations for each of us as we're talking to younger generations that we can do since I don't talk to the younger generation all the time, like you guys do. I can okay. try. All right, yeah. I think maybe having a little bit more of a focus on the purpose of the organization. So what drove me to move to Anglo-American is really about our focus on sustainability. And I think a lot of the younger generation really has a lot more want to see how they can make a change in the world instead of just companies talking about it. They want to see it. And I think Anglo has done a fantastic job of promoting what their purpose is 
in that space, as well as you know, taking some of the tools from the innovation and technology and really trying to drive it to be a little bit more technical, a little bit more cool, so that we can uh, bring more of a different talent base to the organization. So uh, I'm from the Generation A, since we talked about Generation Z. <laughs> the, the video games I play are from 1800s, uh, according to what my daughter says. So Minecraft, how many of you have played Minecraft? Yeah, Minecraft is all about materials requirement, and you go, you mine it, right? And these are the kids that claim they know nothing about mining, yeah. right? And so the challenge for us is with all the grand titles in the room, there's quite a few of you here in this room, the challenge is how can you get your organizations to engage with Minecraft? What can you do you know, on, on, on the video gaming and all of that stuff? Could we, for example, have a, uh, a Minecraft competition at a school? And then guess what? If you're good at it or something like that, our mind will show you how it's done for real. Or perhaps I will let you do the blast yourself. Go break some company property <laughs> without explosives, right? <laughs> Think about that. And, and here is how I'll make my case. If you read a, a paper now, this month's uh, mining engineering uh, by some uh, young colleagues in Arizona, and they said that when they surveyed students and they informed they were mining, this is in their freshman general engineering course, their interest level in mining went up, unlike, say, in civil engineering and some of the other majors. So the point is this. The more they know about mining, the more they want to know. They're, they're engaged more. So that gives us a pathway to attack. And we see this, like I said earlier. So anyhow, so for the Generation Zs and the next Generation As will be like me, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's the video games and some of these other avenues. How can we tap into that? And, uh, you know, I would love to see it in Salt Lake City Airport. You're going down. You see Alta. You see skis. You see uh, bicycles. I would love to have a bicycle there in the mountains. You know, Utahns are crazy. They ride bi bikes uphill all the time. Very fit people. I would love to see product of mining. It takes money to do that. I don't have the money to do it. But somebody has. And so it's those things to say, look, the skiing you just did, thanks to us. It's all implicit, and we assume they know it, but actually they don't. And so it's some of those things, you know? Okay. Thank you, Rajiv. Amanda, you had a question? Oh, we do have one more question, Rebecca. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Camille. I work for Langen Engineering, and I go to the Colorado School of Mines. Um, so as a uh, professional woman, I have a, I have a good understanding of what I think my value is, what I bring to the table and what I bring to my organization. Um, and I know specifically in, at this conference, we're talking about employee attraction and retention. But what other values, um, will what other metrics can we use to describe the value of a diverse workforce, of a um, gender inclusive workforce? What other metrics are we using to track and show performance for companies and schools and organizations that are taking on these steps and building, um, yeah, building kind of like these communities within their organizations. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take a crack at this one um, because we we were talking at our table. I'm I'm at the table there with with Camille, and uh, we we were talking about this stat that's been out there for a while that. You know, uh, men looking at a job posting will say, yeah, if I hit about 40% of that, I'm applying. Yeah. And whereas women will more likely look to make sure that they've ticked every box. And we're talking about that that can hold people back. They can hold themselves back in doing that. Um, one of the things we didn't get a chance to talk about is performance reviews. And there is also an emerging body of research that says that women can do the same thing there. And so can others who will downplay their achievements, um, attribute their success to part of a group, which may be very, very true, by the way. But you don't necessarily see the same thing happening with male counterparts sometimes, where they may say, oh, yeah, yeah, I did that. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a group involved. Yeah, they, they did a few things, but it was mostly me. 
Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a difference. And the other space it comes in is less in the write-up, but if you've got a performance management system where people are supposed to assign themselves ratings, it's definitely proven that men will typically assign themselves a higher rating on average. Okay. I think, Camille, you said you know your value. I think that's part of the challenge. Know your value, call it out, claim it, um, stand up for it in, in the ways that you can. Because I think that makes its way into some of the metrics that, that we can shift over time. The, the value of things like business resource groups and other communities and, and diversity in general, there's a really interesting model that was, um, and of course I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name. Uh, it, it deals with psychological safety though. And what it does is dr uses psychological safety as the pathway to draw a line from inclusion to innovation. We talked about a little bit ago about uh, you know uh, innovation rising as you bring more perspectives in, and that's always been there, sort of as a, as an anecdotal idea. Of course, you bring more ideas in, you're going to get it. But what this what this model says is we can actually start to track that. We can look at psych factors of psychological safety within an organization as predictors of innovation success, and I just find that one really interesting as having potential to do what you're asking about, having potential to actually put some numbers to the value of both diversity and inclusion within an organization because it's been hard to quantify up till now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Amanda, how are we doing with time? Yeah, Great, perfect. We Risa. have time for one more question? Yes, we do. Perfect. Thanks, my name is Risa Fury, I'm with Stantec. Iris, thank you very much for your answer. Um, I, I guess I have a little bit of a comment and a question about it. So um, you talked about how men would approach uh, an application and how women would do something else. And the subtext there is that women should change. And um, I guess I, I wonder if there's any thoughts on the panel about how instead of asking women to always be the ones who change, how we ask you know, society to do that differently. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let everyone else answer that after I say really good point. Thank you for bringing it up, you're dead right. Um, but other thoughts? I just think uh, moving more away from women competing against each other. I think if we are helping each other to promote our skills and even yesterday I was participating in a team building event and there were men on our team that were talking about the different skills that I brought to the team. And I was like, oh, I would have never written that down about myself or I would have never thought that I had that value. So I think if we can bring more of that influence into ourselves and trying to find more of our own self-awareness, one, it will help us you know, rate ourselves a little bit higher, but I think men will also feel like oh, I actually answered this with a genuine answer instead of feeling like I have to promote myself a little bit higher. I got real results, and now I can genuinely answer that um, with the right answer. Well, thank you for that question. Actually, that's a very uh, good question. And rather than us expecting the women to change, I think as a leadership team in the whole industry, we need to start uh, considering is the job description is still good, what was written 20 years ago, or is there any element in the job description that is written in a way that the women will not be even inclined to apply? Because that's a real world event today. So I think the action is with us in the industry to make sure that any new job is just getting posted. And you can imagine how many thousands of jobs are getting posted every day in the mining industry worldwide. But do we have a process where we check those to make sure that they are not somehow going through an unconscious bias process? So, you know, we as a Caterpillar, of course, are training all our leader in uh, unconscious bias approach. But uh, that's an area I think we can all uh, possibly focus in the industry. Okay. Uh, please I have go a ahead, quick, co yeah, quick comment. So there's two things uh, uh, I know at the university when we do hires. They focus 
uh, the, the, you know, they're trying to come up with better ways where you can draw out the best from a person. So perhaps she will not brag. What questions can you ask where you're digging that out instead of her having to volunteer? Second, I, I just read this article somewhere. Like in Europe, I know in India, I was used to seeing salaries being posted with the job descriptions. That is not done here. So it is very well known women will not negotiate or they tend not to negotiate. And so some of these things that employers can do that will take away some of these issues, you know, acknowledging that these exist. So. Perfect. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. And that actually leads us into wrap up and closing remarks. We have about a minute and we'll just uh, go through all our panelists and we'll start with you, Rajiv. Yeah, no, uh, uh, to me, I'm, I'm really honored uh, uh, to be part of this group and, uh, and uh, it's it's just wonderful uh, just to see all of you know the, all the diversity, and uh, I'm I, I'm really energized to see how many leaders there are in this room. And you know, one of the things I keep asking is, I really hope you produce a document and you push it through your own companies. You, many of you are real close to the top, and you have uh, the ability to make a change. So now it's not the industry that is going to change; it's you who has to do it because you are the industry now because you're in that position. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. I'll echo Rajiv's sentiment. It's a real honor to be uh, up here with this group and in this room with all of you and uh, everybody online too. Um, I guess it comes to mindset for me. I, I know I said that at the beginning, but I think uh, we've talked about things we can go after to help change mindsets. And uh, doing that strategically doing it smartly, doing it craftily where we have to, um, to really uh, drive that change because that is the foundation, right? That, that's, everything else seems to spring, spring out of that in my head at least. And I think if we, if we can change the way that we're talking about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in our organizations, um, good things are gonna happen. Oh, thanks. I think um, stealing some of Elaine's words from earlier about being bold and taking that into the context of how we're changing the business, how we're making that transformation. So if something was always done an old way, being bold to be the person, even if you're a female, to stand up and say, that is a terrible way of doing it. There's a new way of doing it this way that's safer, more efficient for our operations. And really making sure that you're the bold person that can stop the old way of working and make that actual transition happen. I think that's stealing your words, but thanks. Yeah, my thoughts are about the continuous improvement. You know, this is a journey, and I think we just got to focus on improving every day. How, what can we learn and improve? And I think the two key takeaways I'd like to share with you is one, is we need to go after the talent pool right from the middle school days. And if you're coming late in the game, then how do we change our face of the industry that we attract talent from the adjacent pools? So those are the two key takeaways I would like to leave with you. And of course, the technology and digital will continue to help us in that journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, and it's been an honor to moderate you, and thank you to the audience in the room and virtually for all the questions. And with that, <clears throat> excuse me, and with that, I would like for us to give everyone a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>